Okay, so to get us going today, everybody, I hope, again, I hope everybody had a, a good weekend um, and you're feeling energized for the final last little bit of the semester here. So, so far, it looks like uh, for a relatively small sampling of uh, folks that are here this morning, um, overall, you guys are feeling, personally, you guys are feeling optimistic, which is great. Um, so, uh, some angry, some frustrated, I totally get all that. Um, but optimistic seems to be um, the uh, ruling the day. Optimistic and cautiously optimistic <laughs> seem to be ruling the day, which is positive. And I would say that that even though there are some challenges still ahead, I think compared to where we were a year ago, compared to where we were six months ago, um, I'm hoping you guys feel a lot more um, hopeful and a lot more positive for for uh, as much as things aren't perfect. At least it seems, uh, you guys are telling me, at least in, in general, things seem to be going in the right direction. And then um, with regards to California overall, um, better. You guys seem to think that things are going um, better. So that's, again, uh, great to hear, great to hear. We'll come back to the rest of those questions uh, later, but I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that, that at least uh, the, majority of you have uh, positive um, sentiments going forward. So that's great. Very happy to hear that. Let me start this bad boy. All right, cool. Can everybody see my screen? Everybody see my slides? Yes. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, all right, so let's, uh, oh man, no, 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 uh, this guy wants to get in the act. Let's, uh, Make that dude go away. Okay, um, so great. So, so our last uh, uh, topic here to talk about um, is going to be pandemics, right? Obviously, we're in the middle of a pandemic and in the middle of something you guys will all remember for the rest of your lives, um, and uh, and and may well impact us. We don't know yet, but may well impact all of us uh, for the rest of our lives. Certainly, our last um, major global pandemic um, uh, that was an influenza pandemic. Um, left very long um, fingerprints on society and people's behaviors and things of that nature. So um, there's there's definitely reason to think that our current pandemic um, may well uh, have the same kind of um, legacy and impact. So uh, before we get into talking about uh, what's been going on here, and you guys, please, please, please interrupt me. So normally I, I always say, hey, you guys interrupt me whenever during my lectures, but this one in particular, since this is not a done deal, right? I'm, I'm not lecturing about an earthquake that happened a while ago or a hurricane that happened a while ago. This is, we're in the midst of this. This is very much so a work in progress. So please interrupt me or ask questions if something is, um, if I say something incorrectly or if you're wondering about stuff. So so just unmute and and and, and poke me or, or interrupt me. Um, okay, so so first thing to say is we've been here before, right? As with so many of our disasters, um, when we have these bad things happen, these disasters occur, um, rarely is it the very first one, right? It's, it's rather um, something, it might be more intense, it might be um, slightly different scale than some past events, but, but rarely do we have a totally de novo type of um, disaster. Um, and so, so let's talk about the, the last big influenza pandemic um, at the end of World War II, 1917, 1918. Um, and uh, it's, it's crazy how similar, um, and at least in a gross sense, things are and things, uh, things were uh, to, to what was going on back then. So first and foremost, um, uh, politics and propaganda. So we were leaving a world war. We were leaving a time when our country was actively, and, and, and many of the nations around the world were actively trying to control the narrative. A war was going on. They were very much interested in um, uh, motivation and keeping the populace behind the war effort in the respective countries. And so most countries were radically clamping down on uh, information. As a consequence, um, and, and you guys tell me, but so have you heard this referred to as the, the Spanish flu? Yeah. 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 Right. So, um, 
I, 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 when I grew up, I heard as a, as, a, as a Spanish flu, and I used to refer to it as a Spanish flu, um, basically until about uh, two, two and a half years ago when I was listening to a historian talk. Um, we call it the Spanish flu, or, or we have the popular nomenclature of the Spanish flu, simply because Spain was a neutral country in World War I. So Spain was one of the few countries that wasn't actively censoring its media. So as a consequence, so, so does anyone know where, where that flu pandemic, the, the first outbreak, the first uh, you know, coming to light of this, this influenza outbreak was? Wasn't it like Kansas or something? Yes. Yeah, it was an army base in Kansas, exactly. So it started in the US, right? So it started with this private um, uh, mid or actually early morning, wasn't feeling good, goes to the, um, the hospital on base. And uh, by lunchtime, there was almost a hundred other soldiers had gone to the infirmary because they were also feeling ill. And then, and then it just went nonstop from there. Um, so, you know, if we were following the conventions, we would call it the, um, the Kansas flu, right? Or the, or the American flu or the United States flu. But instead we call it the Spanish flu because we were um, controlling our press, right? We, we didn't have this freedom of the press and everybody could just report what they wanted, both, both actively um, censoring for the war effort, but also self-censoring by reporters and, and things of that nature. Spain didn't have that. And so when the outbreak eventually gets to Spain, they just start reporting it. And so the first place that most Americans hear about the large scale outbreak of some type of pandemic is from Spain. And so people naturally go, oh man, this is a Spanish, Spanish event. This is a Spanish flu. And so that's where the name comes from. So there's a lot of politics, a lot of propaganda going on. Um, there was also a lot of misreading of what was happening, particularly in the early phases of the, the disaster. Um, so a lot of misreading of the first wave and thinking that this was the worst of it. Um, and very much so like our like the tsunamis we recently discussed. Um, uh, the first wave is bad to be sure, but uh, um, uh, the first wave was just sort of uh, getting you ready. And then the big uh, devastation came in the second wave. Um, there's a lot of individualized responses across the country and across the world. There was not a sort of unified default medical establishment clearly saying from day one, this is how we should respond. And so some cities were more restrictive, some cities were more liberal, um, um, et cetera. And uh, we really didn't understand, we really didn't appreciate the global nature of, um, of this event, right? So, so this pandemic, so we've had pandemics in the past we've, that have taken you know, tens of millions of people at, at different times, if we're talking about something like uh, the bubonic plague in the Middle Ages in Europe. Um, uh, so we have had quite devastating plagues, but this was really the one of the first um, of, um, we could also talk about things like um, uh, infectious diseases and sexually transmitted diseases that came over when the Europeans came to North America that wrecked havoc with the native populations that had no resistance to many of those diseases. But, but as, when we think of sort of the, the modern pandemic of starting and then quickly just burning like a wildfire across the planet, this is really the, the, um, uh, the classic example that most people uh, will use or the most people think of. And um, at the time we didn't appreciate what was going on, right? We're in World War I, moving huge amounts of people around the planet. So obviously not as fast as today with our, with our jet airplanes and, and all that, but still um, compared to most of human history, very large amount of people moving and moving you know, very consistently. So there was trench warfare in, in Europe where World War I was primarily focused. And so this is very ugly fighting people in very um, uh, stress conditions, their immune system stress, their stress, they're, I mean, for God's sake, they're in a war. But then on top of that, they're in, in um, you know, wet, horrible conditions, their immune systems are compromised, all this and that. 
um, basically the perfect breeding ground and also in very close quarters, right? So perfect breeding ground, mixing of, of people from around the world, um, um, unsanitary conditions, and then uh, being very close to one another. So all this stuff really helped um, clearly um, turn this very quickly into a, a global catastrophe as opposed to something that just had an impact in one country or one region. Um, I think people very much so underestimated the power of fear. And I think we all felt some amount of fear um, in the last year, year and a half, uh, um, not knowing what was going on, seeming like all kinds of people were dropping like flies, seeming, or, or when people got sick, not knowing if I'm going to be okay or not, right? All, the, the, the unknown um, can be incredibly um, dangerous and the unknown for a long period of time can be very uh, uh, erosive to our mental health, um, uh, to, you know, everything as you guys can appreciate. Um, and then, and then lastly, as with so many of our disasters, um, a general lack of infrastructure, a lack of planning, a lack of preparation. Now, in this case, maybe not so much the infrastructure that we might talk about in the context of, say, uh, fire engines moving around a wildfire or um, uh, coastal wetlands or other protections to, to deal with hurricanes, but nevertheless, um, the equivalent public health structure and public health planning. We were just really developing um, some of the modern, uh, what would become successes uh, for uh, much of the world in terms of um, anesthetics, in terms of um, antibiotics, in terms of sterile procedures, um, all these things that would lead to huge public health benefits. We didn't have those uh, really fully in place in, in the late 19, uh, 19 teens. Uh, and uh, we didn't have um, as much of a centralized planning for, for how we might distribute resources and things of that nature uh, in the context of a public health crisis. And so as a consequence, there's a lot of, hey, just stay home, right? Hey, oh, you're sick? Yeah, just don't come out of your house kind of deal, right? Which um, doesn't really serve anyone uh, ultimately. Um, okay. Uh, and this this image in the background was just from San Diego, but but uh, you know it could be it could be a picture right from I mean with the exception of the clothes could be a picture from uh, today right. Okay, so uh, uh, first we'll talk about a couple key terms just so that we're all on the same page before we start talking more specifically about um, pandemics. So um, what is a pandemic? Obviously, a pandemic is uh, some type of disease. Um, so this is, so disease is a disorder of an organism, uh, of an organism's, uh, you know, physical part or physiological processes, especially one that produces signs or symptoms that affects a particular location that can result in a, a physical injury. Diseases can, can manifest in multiple ways, but that's a classic when we think of a disease as a disease. More specifically, when we're talking about pandemics, we're talking about an, an infectious disease. And this is, this is um, something, a disease that's conveyed by an organism or a virus. Technically speaking, a virus isn't an organism or possibly a prion, which technically isn't an organism. But by and large, we're talking about things like uh, bacteria, things like viruses, et cetera. Okay, um, so related terms here, epidemiology, which is the study of disease, um, how it occurs, how it physically distributes across the landscape, and how we might intervene to, um, to minimize its spread or minimize its, its, its negative aspects. Generally speaking, we're talking about the infectious disease component of this, but also, but also um, epidemiology does include other health factors that aren't necessarily directly um, infectious, but might uh, relate to uh, infectious diseases. Uh, an epidemic is a widespread occurrence of one of those infectious diseases in a community at a particular time. So, so an epidemic is something that happens in Santa Barbara, something that happens in Ventura County, something that happens in Southern California type of thing. And then if that, if that infectious disease 
uh, uh, manages to break out of that one one area and continue to infect uh, people and 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 continue to spread, then we would refer to that as a pandemic. So, so epidemic and pandemic are just sort of different degrees of intensity. A pandemic is just an epidemic on steroids. And and sometimes people use the term significant or major pandemic um, to refer to something that's particularly impactful. Uh, zoonosis uh, is is a term that we use, it, it's maybe more familiar to you or easier to understand as a zoonotic disease. And this is a um, is one of those infectious, um, the things that's causing the infectious disease moving from, traditionally it's moving from an animal to a person, to a human being, but actually can go the reverse as well. Um, but but we, we typically think about it from our selfish human anthropocentric perspective as something going from an organ, from a different, from a non-human species into a human individual and causing problems. Um, but technically it can go, it, it just means jumping species. So it doesn't have to involve just humans. It could be a species that jumps from a bird to a, a pig or something like that, um, et cetera. Would that include the uh, bubonic plague because of the rats to humans or? Well, I, I, did you ask me that again? Uh, would that include the bubonic plague because rats? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So indeed, most of these types of epidemics are, are indeed uh, zoonotic in, in origin. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, let me just see if I can move my, my, my thing out of the way. Let me see if I can hide this. Can I hide this? Hide floating menu controls. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, and then, um, uh, and then once that zoo, once that jump happens, if it if it starts to spread beyond that one individual or beyond that that handful of individuals and starts to get into the wider population, then we would say that disease has become epizootic. So so the zoonosis is the jumping is the is the actual movement, um, and you can have that and you can get sick, but if it doesn't infect anyone else, we wouldn't call it an episodic epizootic um, uh, event. But again, most of our pandemics are going to go through all these uh, stages. Uh, and so just to, and just uh, to mention to everyone, so we're all on the same page here, th this notion of, of jumping from one species to another and leading to disease is actually quite common. So here's a few examples. So uh, rabies. So rabies has an ancient origin. I, I have not been able to figure out, I, I haven't done a full reading of all the literature on rabies. I tried. I looked pretty quickly uh, this weekend, but I, I couldn't couldn't track it down. But um, there's definitely evidence of this happening at least five thousand years before present. So at least something like three thousand A.D., if not significantly older, um, uh, the jump occurred. The first jump occurred. Um, and so this is, and so rabies, there's actually a, a few different viruses within uh, the genus, within, the, within the, the group of viruses that can cause rabies. Um, and we think that the, the most problematic one that we're worried about now, which mostly comes from dogs, dogs um, are, are the primary thing that uh, expose um, people to rabies these days. Uh, we think it went from bats into some carnivore, probably a skunk or a raccoon first. And then from there, it, it has been hanging out in a lot of vertebrates uh, for many thousands of years. About, I think it was about 1300 years ago, there was a, a significant mutation that gave us the, the, the particular flavor that now we mostly um, are dealing with. But rabies is an example. Uh, another example would be West Nile virus. So this was first isolated from a lady um, in Uganda in 1937 uh, and uh, would go on to have some problems locally, um, uh, locally around um, uh, that region of Africa. Uh, and it took all the way until 1997 for us to at least recognize that, it, that this disease had become um, deadly, had become disease causing to birds, and this was 1997 in Israel. Um, this was this was um, positively confirmed. Very quickly from then, it it leaves uh, it, it 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 leaves 
Europe, Africa, Middle East area and makes it over to the US. So we first find it in some tires or we first find it in some mosquitoes that we think are breeding in tires in New Jersey in 1999. And within a couple of years, it burns its way across uh, to California. So it goes across North America very, very quickly. Um, and this is a, um, th this is an example of a, one of our diseases that um, is spread through mosquitoes and particularly mosquitoes biting birds. So birds are impacted, horses are impacted, humans are impacted. Um, in fact, the way we, we, we do our sentinel monitoring for West Nile all across the country is different vector control agencies, different public health agencies uh, maintain flocks of chickens or, or, or coops of chickens. Um, and they, they draw the blood from the chickens every week and see uh, you know, chickens st stashed around, say, the county. Um, and, and we look to see if they have evidence of exposure to the West Nile virus. Um, influenza, obviously, we just, we, we just we opened our discussions today talking about uh, uh, influenza. This is really old. Don't know when this first got into to people, but it's been a long time. Um, the first uh, recorded, positively recorded pandemic was 1580. So, um, so uh, you know, at least what we would call a pandemic for, you know, we're talking 500 years or so. We currently recognize four different types of influenza, A, B, C, and D. And these different uh, strains um, have uh, greater affinity to some critters versus others. So some are more likely to um, have come from or reside in in a reservoir of pigs or of horses or of birds or of pig. Oh, I said pigs twice. Man, what I said? Pigs, of horse, uh, horse, bird, pig, cattle. Um, what? There's something else I wanted to put in there. Well, I can't remember. This is what happens when I write my lectures uh, uh, too late. But but basically, um, influenza, very old, uh, vi a viral uh, pandemic, as we all know. Uh, HIV, another virus, first uh, gets into humans uh, via primates uh, in the 1950s, but doesn't seem to, and probably happened several times, there's several jumps, but none of those really seems to take off, um, at least as far as we can tell. But then some mutation happens, and by the late 70s, it starts to be able to reproduce and spread from human to human. So before then, it, it seems to have not been able to, it, it could go from the, the animal, make the jump into humans, but not, not uh, you know, take out other humans. But, but by the late 70s, it had uh, achieved that ability. And obviously um, this is the virus that causes HIV. And we're still in the, the global pandemic, the, the HIV pandemic that started uh, first recognized back in 1981. Uh, and then another example here, I just realized when I was throwing out these quick examples that uh, they're, all, they're all viral, um, which is maybe understandable in our current condition. But again, many uh, potential organisms could cause an epidemic and cholera here, which would be the classic example of a bacterial um, uh, uh, pandemic um, was first, um, uh, identified in terms of, uh, first identified as, as what we would call cholera in 1563 in India. And um, about 200 years later, 300 years later, um, it uh, had its first uh, outbreaks, the first um, epidemic, as we would describe it, um, from contaminated rice uh, in India as well. So this is, this is a very famous example um, this is, uh, you might remember this from your introductory bio textbooks or maybe some of your introductory um, ecology classes or, or, or if you've taken any public health classes, this is the classic example. So this was, this, this birthed the modern field of epidemiology and public health. And so this was uh, John Snow in London in the 1840s, late, late, late 1840s, early 1850s. And this was the example where everybody was getting sick and he realized it was because there was one, people were using a communal water pump and that there was this, uh, this one water pump that he, through using brilliant statistics and quantitative data, surveying people, very accurately measuring, measuring where people were when they were sick and, and trying to look at the, 
their attributes that would be in common with one another and figured out that it was this water pump and went and, and got the handle removed from that water pump so people could not get water from that pump even if they tried. And that, that killed the outbreak of cholera. So cholera is a waterborne uh, disease associated with human, uh, with human waste um, and, and improper uh, sanitation. So, um, so zoo, all, all these things are example of, of, of things jumping from one critter to another. Um, major, ep so, th so that's just the idea of, of going from uh, one species to another. Major epidemics are also unfortunately pretty common. So it looks like, wow, it looks like my, my bullets are creatively spaced here. I guess I'm starting in the middle of my, <laughs> middle of my bullets. That's interesting. Um, so uh, according to the World Health Organization, which is a United Nations organization that you might have been reading about these days in, in the news, um, has garnered some controversy for, for some of its statements and some of its positions. But the WHO is the global, um, uh, the global public health entity um, that defines if we're in a pandemic um, and, and helps respond to this and, and, and promotes vaccinations for different countries around the world, et cetera. Uh, and according to the WHO's database, we've had 11 pandemics since 1970. So again, pandemics, so the jumping isn't too new, having a pandemic isn't too new. And again, we mentioned already the HIV epidemic that started and was first recognized, at least codified in 1981. Uh, SARS, uh, 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 sudden acute respiratory syndrome, uh, which broke out in Asia in uh, 2002 to 2003. Swine flu or H1N1, which uh, uh, broke out uh, in uh, 2009 to 2010. Uh, which was which is a flu virus. So the the <clears throat> the H is the H and the N refers to the, some of the different proteins on the coating of the the virus. And there is man, I should have written this down. I, don't, I think there's 18 or so different H's. Uh, I probably had to get that wrong, but something like 18, and there's something like 12 or so N's. And so all of our flu viruses can be can be binned into into one of those you know, one of those protein families, basically. Um, and so H1N1 was the swine flu one. Oh, look, now, now my bullets go up high. That's I'm doing great here today. Um, uh, so 11 pandemics since 1970, uh, over 1,500 new pathogens since 1970. Those, now, those could be either um, epizootic jumps or they could be um, they could be a, a, a major major mutation, um, but regardless, that's a lot of challenges to our immune system. A lot of potential disasters that could be erupting. Um, and as but one example of that, Ebola, which is sort of the classic boogeyman um, of of freaky, scary, end of the world uh, horror film type viruses. Ebola is a type of virus uh, in the Marburg family. Um, and named after the Ebola River. And uh, this is the one that, you know, you can bleed out of your eyes and just horrible stuff. Um, and at times has a very high um, mortality uh, when, when, you, when you get exposed to it. Um, that one family of viruses has caused over 25 epidemics since 1970. They've mostly been relatively contained in to, to the local village or the local um, uh, uh, region where they where they happened. Um, oh, now I'm back to my 11 pandemics. Man, this is a this is a powerful lecture I'm giving you guys. I hope you appreciate how how incredibly. Um, maybe maybe I'm just trying to mix it up. Maybe I'm trying to do like avant garde lecturing today. Um, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, Zika, uh, the Zika virus in 2015, this was again the one that um, uh, caused various problems, but most dramatically um, uh, hydrocephaly uh, um, um, birth defects in, in babies that were, that were born to mothers that contracted the Zika virus um, uh, in various places, but most explicitly in Brazil. And we've actually had, so the, so the plague question that we, that we were talking about a, a, a minute ago, um, plague is still around, right? The, the, the black death as it were. Um, and the most recent was in 2017 in Madagascar. Um, so, 
So these pathogens are still coming, um, pandemics are still coming, and this is, even though we don't pay attention to it, and I think for us, for most of us, it seems like, oh my God, this is a once in a generation pandemic, this COVID thing. Um, and man, we haven't had anything like this since, since uh, you know, 100 years ago. And to an extent, that's, that, that's a fair assessment, but, but we've been having hints of this and elements of this, just like we maybe haven't had a massive hurricane, but we've had a lot of tropical storms, tropical storms, tropical storms, category one hurricanes, et cetera, in the intervening period, which illustrate to us, if we're paying attention, what could go wrong if we weren't prepared. Okay, uh, questions so far? Yeah, how does uh, coronavirus stack up with all these, uh, just based on death counts and stuff? Is it bigger than the Spanish flu? I'm assuming it no. is. No, so that's a great question. Uh, Joe, I'll hold that till I, I, we look at some data later on the lecture. But the short answer is um, we're bad, but we're nowhere near as bad as the, as the um, um, Spanish flu. So um, it, 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 it killed on the order of 30 to 40 million people. Um, it, well, one, one our, our population was much smaller, but, but even just on raw numbers, you know, tens of millions of people were dying. Um, and we're not, thankfully, we're not there yet. And hopefully, if we continue to get these vaccines going, we, we won't um, be that bad. But the potential is there. The potential is there when this happened. The potential is always there until we really get a handle on these things and until we get something like a vaccine that can really um, tamp it down. So yeah, so, but good question, good question. Other questions? So on that, one, that one's on pause until we go for a little bit more. Okay, so a couple, um, a couple uh, themes here, just, just to sort of, uh, uh, um, before we leave this idea of these things are common. Um, uh, and again, this, this would go in the category of uh, overall aspects of disasters, right? So first, diseases rarely disappear. So they just mentioned we had that, we had the plague, right? That the, the Black Death, um, that that swept through Europe um, all those centuries ago is still around, and uh, most recently it hit Madagascar, um, had about twenty five hundred uh, people infected, and about two hundred people died. Um, there can be a huge toll from these disasters, even if the the body count isn't super high. So an example of that would be the the SARS outbreak. So and so that outbreak in 2002, 2003, um, only infected about 8,000 people-ish, only killed about 800 people, uh, but it's estimated to have cost about $40 billion, right? So it shut down uh, um, air travel, it shut down, um, you know, uh, uh, manufacturing in, in, in Asia where this was where this was happening and caused all kinds of uh, economic uh, impacts. <clears throat> um, preparedness does work. So um, I was going to put my my picture in from my swine flu story from a, a village on the on the um, Iranian border, but I, I can tell you that story if you guys want. But but anyway, but but long story short, preparedness does work. So we saw from the 2009 um, outbreak of so-called swine flu, again, another influenza uh, uh, type, of, type of outbreak, um, uh, we got on it, right? And we really uh, encouraged, pe encouraged people, encouraged governments, gave them support, said, you know, um, massive culling, for example, of uh, chickens, of uh, all, all kinds of fowl, all kinds of birds, which was a major reservoir for this disease, which could be in humans or in birds, um, spread by mosquitoes and 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 uh, and or contact with the with the blood, um, and we were able to to put the lid on that and get that guy contained. So if we do prepare and if we are serious and we approach it as adults, we can actually contain these things, even in today's modern age, even with all the interconnectivity of airplanes and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we can also react really quickly. 
So um, the first big Ebola epidemic that was not localized, this spread to three African countries and it, and it was looking like it maybe was gonna go to maybe all of Africa and then maybe all of the planet. Um, uh, so um, the American government uh, really took decisive action and helped send um, all kinds of um, um, medical equipment, public health equipment, um, 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 sterilization stuff, vector control stuff, exposure control stuff, PPE, all that jazz, mobile hospitals, et cetera. And we really quickly were able to get, get a handle on this Ebola outbreak and uh, help it to not escape um, the, uh, uh, the, the confines of, of that area. There was a few people here and there, but by and large, we, we reacted very quickly and, and pretty darn well. Unfortunately, the, those plans were shelved under the last administration, um, but they, they may well have helped us a lot more um, with the COVID uh, if we had, you know, used the lessons learned. Anyway, um, so, uh, and, then, and then the last sort of big point here, as with many of our disasters, right, our decisions that we're making um, intentionally or unintentionally, explicitly or implicitly are really um, helping to set the stage for future uh, pandemics, future uh, uh, disease disasters. And so an example of that is the Zika, I'm using here the example of Zika. And uh, what's going on here is the spread of Aedes aegypti, which is this uh, mosquito, which comes from the Middle East, which originated in the Middle East and now is all over the place. So we have it here in the US, it's in Central America, it's in South America, et cetera. And this is really the main vector, the main organism that is spreading the disease. And, um, and this, while, while to be clear, it can be spread by many, I, I don't remember, I wanna say it's something on the order of upwards of like 18 different mosquito species, I think are potentially able to spread it, but the vast amount, the, the vast majority of the spread is done by this one species. It's highly efficient at spreading this disease and actually other diseases as well. Um, but, but one of the reasons that um, mosquito is spreading is because of us, right? We've, we've facilitated its movement across um, uh, continents. We have created the situation in places like flavellas and, and areas where we don't, we have a lot of trash, particularly things like tires that capture water that are perfect breeding grounds for mosquitoes. And through things like climate change, where we're making um, a, a greater area, we're, we're increasing the temperature, we're, we're making it more mosquito-like weather in more areas of the world. So all of that, we're fostering the spread of this disease. So, so um, these diseases um, uh, can be, once they're around, they can be around for a very long time. Most of them stick around. Um, huge economic toll. Um, we, but when we do prepare, it, it does make a difference. We can, um, we can stop these things. We can react quickly, even in remote areas of the world. Um, but again, our decisions oftentimes are making it more challenging because we're oftentimes making it more likely that these events will occur. Okay, um, any questions about that? I right, got a couple more minutes for our first break. So let's just talk um, uh, briefly. So I'm just going to go over some, some, some quick things here in terms of basic epidemiology, just so that we're all on the same page. And since we're all coming out of this, this pandemic, you can have fun things to talk about at, uh, at your 4th of July bar barbecue or something. Um, so usually in terms of public health, when we talk about things like infectious diseases, we talk about an, a chain of infection. And so most of the, the management, the response to dealing with this disaster to dealing with this, this ongoing catastrophe is to short circuit it. And one of the ways we talk about short circuiting, short circuiting it is to short circuit the infection chain. So the idea here is this is this is we're spinning around clockwise. So we go from one to two to three to four to five to six to one to two to three to four to five to six. And that's how the infectious agent spreads. And so, um, so we'll just start with that. So we have to first obviously have something that, that can cause disease. So a, uh, a fungus or a, or a bacterium or something. 
Um, and then that infectious agent has to have a reservoir, a place where it can um, magnify itself, where it can reproduce, where it can make more of, its, of itself, more of its propagules. Uh, next, there has to be a way for it to leave that reservoir. So if a reservoir is me, if it's inside me and, it's, and this infection is growing in me, it has to have a way to get out. So maybe if it's a respiratory thing, maybe it's like, <laughs> maybe I cough or I sneeze, right? Um, so so a, a mechanism to get, to get out of the reservoir. Um, uh, next is, is how is it going to be trans transmitted? There's, there's generally considered five broad, we can be much more fine scaled here, but by and large, five broad categories of how things are transmitted. And you guys might recall in the early days of the coronavirus, this was a huge topic of discussion. We were all first locked away in our houses, and some people were like, spraying bleach on all their Amazon boxes and their pizza boxes and their mail. Like we don't, you don't touch the mail for several days, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that was because we weren't early on, we weren't clear about the mode of transmission. So the basic mode of transmission could be contact. So physically touching uh, the, the thing. Now that can be, that could be me touching the portal of exit. That could be, be touching, you know, if my son has, is sick and is, is, as a runny nose and I touch his runny nose and then I touch my nose or something like that, right? That could be direct contact. Or it could be my son has a runny nose, he touches this can, puts the can down, and then sometime later I come up and pick up that can, touch that can, and then it gets on, right? So, so either way, that, that's, a, that's a contact mode. Uh, and then one that's still under debate, and I think one that's gonna actually uh, come with a lot of technical lessons or, or one of the, the key technical lessons we're going to take away from this. There has been some um, uh, missteps. There's been some, some misunderstanding and some, some lack of clarity about this next part. So things can be spread by droplets. And that's primarily things like, um, you know, spit or, 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 or sneezes, that kind of stuff. Um, and, and a droplet is defined as something as a, as a as a particle or, or in a matrix that's five micrometers or bigger, because the idea is it's in some chunk of mucus or whatever, um, it can't just go floating everywhere. So it it has a relatively uh, limited dispersal range, and then it then it gravity pulls it down. So that's a droplet. Airborne is a much finer particle, and airborne can be lofted for much longer periods. Um, and, and so hence that that's where a lot of the confusion came from. So you sometimes hear airborne referred to as an aerosol, um, a, 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 a aerosol um, particle. Then we can have vectors. And so this is where um, not the reservoir, something different from the reservoir, um, but the classic thing would be a mosquito, right? So mosquito goes and, and bites an infected horse or human or whatever sucks up some blood and with that blood comes the bacterium or the virus and then that mosquito flies around and then lands on me and and, and bites me and then in the process of of um a, a spitting into the wound where it adds some anesthetic and um anticoagulant so it can suck my blood out um it also some of its saliva and some of its juices basically can get into my body. And so, so that would, that would make the mosquito a vector. Um, most of the vectors are insects. Um, some of them are vertebrates, but most, most classic vectors we think of are insects. And then uh, lastly, something like a common vehicle. So something that, that was not the reservoir, again, not the, not the place where the, where the substances are magnifying and growing and increasing in size, but, but something that gets contaminated and then is transported potentially a long distance. So this would be something like a food, food product got, got infected or got exposed. Um, this could be some type of fluid. This could be some piece of uh, machinery or equipment that was contaminated and then moves around. And then I touch it and, and, and um, uh, eventually get the uh, disease. Okay, so infectious agent, reservoir, portal of exit, mode of transmission, portal of entry, just like the portal of exit, it's, it's how it's getting into our body. So that's getting in through uh, things like mucous membranes, or that's getting in through our digestive tract if we, if we 
drank the fluid or something of that nature, or if we cut our cut our hand or something like that. Uh, and then lastly, um, it has to be uh, uh, in a susceptible host, meaning when that disease gets inside of me, um, I have to not have any physical barriers or or physiological barriers. So, so I, I, I do not have any immunity. So when it gets in, it actually causes disease. So now that I thankfully have my vaccinations, if I got exposed to the coronavirus, hope, hopefully, right? We, we don't know what these mutations that are coming around, but, but, but in all likelihood from what we can tell so far, if I got exposed to coronavirus, um, uh, the vaccines don't prevent you from getting exposed but they um, minimize the likelihood that you would have a significant disease event. So I might feel a little bit, a little bit bad for a bit, but my immune system is now primed and I have immunity to that. And so it's gonna rise up and attack, okay? So, so step six would be if I didn't have any of that. So it got, it got into me and I was, I was, immunologically naive to, and had not, my, my body had not seen that substance before. And my body is not able to mount an immune response. And so if that happens, then, and I get infected and it starts spreading in me, then I become the reservoir, right? And, and, and that infectious agent is inside me and I become a reservoir for maybe the next person. And so we keep going around the loop. So the interventions here are, are based around uh, the, the, the epidemiological approach is trying to knock, in theory, you can knock this, break this chain in many different places, right? So one of the reasons we wear our masks over our face is so that we, we reduce the portal of exit, right? So we're reducing, even though we can still breathe and, and, and some few particles are getting through that mask material possibly, the vast majority are, are getting trapped. And so the vast majority, so we're, we're maybe not eliminating the portal of exit, but we're, we're, we're damaging that part of the chain um, and on and on. And so those are all ways that we try to break the chain. If we can break this chain enough, we can stop the transmission, we can stop the infections. Um, a related thing, how are we doing on time here? A related thing, I guess we'll, we'll go through this example and then we'll pause. A related thing here would be the um, epidemic or the epidemiological triangle. And so this is sort of the same idea as that, as that um, chain, but this is a, a sort of even simpler model. Um, and so uh, this is kind of like our fire triangle when we were talking about wildfires. So how do we have, so, so where are all the parts that we need to, to, to make this disease a pandemic? Um, we have to have the infectious agent, again, as we mentioned, so the, the microbe or the fungus or whatever the heck it is. We have to have the host, the, the thing being infected. And we have to have environmental conditions that, that support both those things, right? So all of these things are supporting one another. If, if we can break one of the legs of this triangle, again, we can intervene and either stop it altogether or make it much less likely that the, the pandemic will spread and, and radically reduce the rate of transmission. Um, so, right, yeah, a bunch of things. We try to break stuff. Agents, as we've already mentioned, are viruses, bacteria, protozoans, uh, 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 fungi, parasites, prions. Um, and so we already talked about that. Um, so, so things that about me that are facilitating the spread, or if I um, try to bolster these, can can help break part of one of the one of the sides of that triangle. Would include overall health. So if I'm in good condition, if I'm eating well, if I'm exercising, if I have good respiratory health, etc., um, that's going to help um, me resist. Um, either physically resist or immunologically have a, have a stronger immune response to being infected. Uh, generally speaking, uh, younger folks have, uh, have more robust immune systems. Really, really just born babies, their immune systems sometimes are immunologically fairly naive. But generally speaking, younger folks, you guys, your ages are, are you're in the prime of health, right? I'm an old dude. So for me, uh, I'm a better host on average than are you guys. And we saw that with the coronavirus where 
the highest mortality by far were our older folks. Um, and so that, does, that doesn't always play out that way. Sometimes it can affect young uh, individuals, but, but in this case, older folks were most susceptible. Uh, then we have comorbidities. Those are factors that um, uh, go along, that correlate and make you more susceptible. So in the case of, of coronavirus, it's being obese, um, it's having um, uh, things like asthma and things of that nature. And so both specific comorbidities and then again, the overall health, as I mentioned before, of the, of the individual. Uh, nutrition, how, how, how good you're eating and, and how well you're provisioning, provisioning your body. And then there's also a genetic component here where some of us just have better um, uh, uh, genetic blueprints to fight off a particular uh, type of um, infectious agent than do other people. Uh, there's, okay, so there's a host side, there's an environment side. So we can talk about the growth setting, socioeconomic setting, and the environment where the where the um, infectious agent is is living and making itself bigger. So I, I I wasn't really sure how to do this. So I have a couple slides here that might be a little repetitive. But um, uh, so growth setting, as we mentioned before, things like climate and weather, ecological dynamics. We find that highly disturbed systems are more likely to see diseases. So right now, the um, for example, the disease that has attacked echinoderms, sea stars, et cetera, off our coast, um, as well as, for example, uh, withering foot syndrome with our abalones uh, in, in the inner tidal with black abs, um, uh, really is facilitated by stressful conditions. So environmental stressful conditions or ecologically stressful conditions um, because of primarily um, anthropogenic disturbances. Um, we see that with coral and things of that nature too. Uh, and then there's there's a, <clears throat> excuse me a geographic setting where um, if if this outbreak just happens to occur, say next to a larger population center or something of that nature, just by the luck of the draw, that can help it get it going, particularly early on in the uh, outbreak. The socioeconomic setting, uh, poverty, uh, highly correlated with with um, outbreaks, again, folks that don't have a lot of economic means are not going to be as likely to have personal protective gear, have access to clean water where they can be washing, uh, you know, readily with soap and water and, and, and that type of stuff. Um, demographics are also going to play a role here um, in terms of, of which groups in society are, are more vulnerable. And again, the disenfranchised folks are going to be, on average, the most um, uh, the most vulnerable. Um, urban crowding is, is one that we see over and over again. That appears to be one of the things that's going on now in India with the, with the coronavirus uh, devastation that's going on there is, is the close, um, the, the high density of folks. Um, and uh, we're also, we're seeing it across the whole country. So it's not just in urban settings, but urban settings are one particularly challenging place where it's just spreading like wildfire. Um, and then there could be issues related to where, again, where the organism is growing, such as the, um, the microflora in a gut or something like that, where uh, the disease is going. Traditionally, we think of the environment as something like the stuff I just men mentioned, uh, traditionally meaning traditional epidemiology, overcrowding, poor sanitation, lack of water to wash your hands, uh, some type of um, flavella or something as we see here uh, on the right. Um, in one of our um, mega cities, on the on the edges of one of our mega cities uh, in the world, um, and this is just giving the disease more chances to do its due, um, and making it more likely that the pathogen can survive outside of that reservoir, can tr can make make the jump, can make tr uh, the transfer, and can enter the um, potential person. Um, yeah, so maybe we'll go one more, one or two more slides, and then we'll take our take our break here. Um, uh, I think I think more recently, so that's how people used to historically think of the environment, and that's a totally valid way to think about the environment. But um, for folks like those of us in ESRM, more recently in, in the last decade or two, we've really come to understand that uh, environment is a much uh, more important factor and a much more diverse um, suite of potential influencers of these disasters. So things like 
change in the environment, having air conditioning um, can can make, for example, you more susceptible because some of some air conditioners are just recycling the air. Some of the air conditioners are changing the humidity. Some organisms do better in humidity. Some do worse in humidity. So, so those can be factors driving um, uh, driving what's going on. Also, just the fact that with air conditioning, a lot of times. So, for example, with with coronavirus in the South, and when we hit it headed into our first summer, the summer of 2020, a lot of um, populations in the southern U.S. were like, hey, we're good, man. Everybody's saying this is a horrible disease. I ain't, I ain't seen anybody, you know, infected, so it's all good. And then it got hot in places like Louisiana and places like Florida. And so where do most people go? They go inside, right, because they want the, the relief of the air conditioner. But that was actually the worst thing to do because now they were concentrating inside and they were more likely to be breathing uh, the same air as other folks. And then we saw the infection rate of COVID go up. Um, uh, different food production and handling, um, potential, specifically things like um, animal feedlots, um, uh, uh, things like farms where we're growing large numbers of organisms. A lot of times also, if we're talking about things like cattle or things like turkeys or that kind of stuff, um, or salmon, uh, we have used large amounts of antibiotics. In the last couple of years, half of all the antibiotics consumed in the U.S. Are, are being consumed, actually more than half, are being consumed by our food production systems. And so that means that if we're just giving tons and tons of antibiotics, for example, to these cows, let's say, that's a potential breeding ground for antibiotic resistant strains of bacteria, for example, and then that can be a, a potential um, breeding ground for, for bacteria that could jump into us and, and be problematic. Um, we do a lot of freezing now of, of foods to transport them around the world to keep them fresh, but also if they're not handled properly before they're frozen, that can simply uh, preserve the, say, the virus. And so when we thaw it out, we could become infected uh, uh, with that organism or with that um, infectious agent. Uh, global weirding, as I like to call it, um, as I mentioned before, different climate, different reservoirs, insects, et cetera, more mosquitoes surviving higher, more mosquitoes surviving more northerly and more southerly towards the poles, et cetera. Exotic pet ownership. More and more folks are uh, keeping exotic pets. More and more folks are trading exotic pets. Um, and not just pets, but but animals for food as well. And, and you re recall that's been one of the controversial or one, one of the um, hypotheses is that the coronavirus maybe started with one of these um, um, live food markets in Wuhan. It's unclear because of the opacity of the Chinese government in terms of everything. But but it, it, everybody was talking about it initially, and, and that clearly is part of the spread. But it may not have been the origin of the um, the current uh, coronavirus outbreak in Wuhan, China. Um, uh, as we mentioned before, fast global travel. We're, we're, we're going to exotic places by in, in large numbers that we historically did not go to, even, even as recently as World War II, that wasn't a very common act, for that matter, even as recently as like the 1970s, we're much, it's much easier to get to these faraway places, and we're much um, more likely to get on airplanes, crowded airplanes at that. And again, I uh, mentioned already immunosuppressives and, and all of that. Um, okay, so uh, why don't we pause there and then we'll start talking about, uh, we'll take our break and we'll come back and we'll start talking specific. So that was our, our background in terms of um, pandemics and sort of general talking about epidemiology and spread. We'll come back and start talking specifically about COVID-19. So we'll take a 10 minute break. I'll, pa I'll pause us here. If you've not taken the survey, I'll rethrow the survey or our questions, excuse me, in the chat. And if you could take that um, at some point in the next 10 minutes, that would be great. So I will see everybody back here. What does my clock say? My clock says 9.12. I'll see everybody back here at uh, 9.22. Cool. Thanks, you guys. <laughs> 